welcome uh, to the third talk on our lecture series at the Sound Studies Institute. Um, so we want to acknowledge that SSI as part of the University of Alberta uh, is located in Edmonton uh, in Canada, which is located on Treaty 6 territory. So we're on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse uh, Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Diné, Ojibwe, Inuit, and many others. SSI is committed to ensuring that those histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community, and welcome to all tonight. Um, so for those um, attending for the first time, uh, the Sound Cities Institute here at the university is a research institute that supports uh, work, kind of acts as a, a bit of a hub on research projects having to do with um, sound or anything that really centralizes sound um, in any way. So we're really interested in um, uh, opportunities to work collaboratively and that's one of the things that we try to provide and this lecture series is part of that effort. So we're just really uh, pleased to be able to um, to do this this year. Uh, this is our third event and first time we've like a lot of people trying to transition to Zoom has been a real challenge and uh, but it's uh, so far, it's just been working out great. So I thank you all for being here tonight. Um, tonight, we're really happy to be um, hosting our Ariane Smith Piquette, uh, the library technician at CKUA Radio uh, here in Edmonton. And she's going to tell us all about some incredible musical recordings um, that are part of their collection. Uh, when I was a kid, my, um, my mother gave me a record. I couldn't find it, but it looks something like this, one of these old 45s. And it was um, a record with the, uh, the, the song on the record was called Little Boy with a Lonely Heart. And the funny thing about this record is it never, it's not famous in any way. I, I think I once did see it on YouTube, which was surprised me, but it was never a hit. In fact, what it was is it was uh, in the 1950s around in certain big cities, there were places where you could go and record a hit on a re you know, record a song that you'd written on a record. Uh, and then the idea was to get enough press to then pass them around to radio stations in the hope that you'd get played. And so the reason I have this is because the mother of one of my uh, mom's child, uh, uh, childhood friends had, had made this recording and she was very proud and she had all of these extra copies because they'd had them made to send to radio stations. So I happen to have a copy of that which is really fun, but I know that radio stations in, end up with copies of all kinds of crazy things <laughs> over the years. So I'm sure that this talk will, will touch on some of those kinds of things tonight. So I'm just really happy to have um, Ariane here and I'll just turn it over to her now, thanks. Hi everyone, I will, before I start my presentation, I will just say that um, that's one thing I didn't include, but we do have the first 45 that Katie Lang ever put out. Um, so it was recorded at Bumstead Recorders in Edmonton and just a little 45, it was white. She, the, I think it came with a cover of her, um, like a little paper sleeve with her dressed as a cowgirl doing a little kick up. Um, anyway, and yeah, they were only, there was I think only a hundred pressed and they gave them out only to, um, marketing a and R trying to get her out there back in the day. And I mean, that's another thing that CK Wade's really done is kind of helped, helped the career of a lot of Albertan artists. So um, didn't put that in there, but once things are less on fire, we'll have tours again and I can show everyone. Um, so I do have a slideshow. Bear with me. Oh, okay. Uh, bear with me. Okay. Um, can everyone see my screen, Scott? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm the library technician at CKUA. Um, I have been there since 2011. I actually started volunteering in 2010 and was hired part-time while I was in school and ended up um, starting full-time there right when I was finished school and I've been there ever since. So um, let me just go through here. So the first thing is what is CKUA? I'm sure a lot of people are somewhat familiar. 
Um, but just to go through, bear with me one second here. Sorry, I am not seeing my notes. Bear with me. There we go. Okay, you guys still see the same thing? I'm going to assume that's yes. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so CKUA is a donor-supported arts organization uh, that connects to the power of music, arts, culture, and story. So we, um, oh my goodness, sorry. I haven't done a presentation in a while. There's going to be a couple hiccups right off the top. So <laughs> uh, I'm the only staff member in the library. Uh, we're a special library, which means that our collection is really put together to serve one specific group. So in our case, that is our announcer producers. Um, generally, my time is divided between acquisitions and collections management. Along with that, I manage a team of library volunteers and I do have quite a few other tasks associated with, associated with the production department. An average day for me is managing an active music promotion inbox. I listen to new music that's sent to us, both digital and physical, and I have to prioritize what's being sent in. Um, to, I keep on top of the new releases that are coming out to make sure that we're going to get what we need in advance, whether that means I have to purchase a copy or chase down a copy through promotional companies. Uh, and then I manage the digital database that holds our um, digital audio. And I make sure that the new music is added to it. So we play, since we play such an eclectic mix of music, um, the volume and the variety of stuff that's sent to us, um, either by independent artists, promotional companies, or the labels themselves, is quite robust and quite diverse. Um, and the, the audience, our listening audience, uh, has that expectation that we are both supporting uh, local Canadian and local Albertan artists, along with um, that musical discovery. So something that's new, that's interesting, but has to be up to a high standard. Um, and also tech support for the users. So, <laughs> um, doo -doo -doo. so a little history of CKUA and the connection to the U of A. Um, CKUA was founded as part of the Al University of Alberta Department of Extension. A.E. Otwell was the first dean of the department and his mandate was to reach out to rural communities. Uh, he went through seven forward model T's in his outreach, outreach to the rural public. Uh, apparently he would pack his car with books and a movie projector and drive to small towns throughout the province. When he got to the town, he would screen informational films in town halls and give informal lectures. So this all changed when the Department of Extension began broadcasting weekly lectures aimed at a rural audience using free airtime on CJCA in 1925. So the Department of Extension purchased CJCA and changed the call signal to CKUA in 1927. So they still had all the work to do to build the actual radio station. So they needed to find masts to carry the antenna, a transmitter, tubes, control board, and studio equipment. Um, and they found help with the Department of Electrical Engineering and quite a bit of their own ingenuity that included using burlap sacks as soundproofing and just buying items kind of piecemeal and then putting them all together. So in November 21st, 1927, CKWA signed on. And they were powered by a 500 watt transmitter. So the transmitter consisted of two 80 foot tall farm windmill towers. So that's what's pictured there. And that's at Pembina Hall on the U of A campus. Um, and HP Brown, he worked for the Department of Extension and he was CKUA's first um, announcer and first program director. So I do have a recording here from him explaining the call letters. It's rather interesting to note how CKUA obtained its call letters in the first place. Uh, the university, of course, was anxious to get on the air. So we bought a small transmitter, I think about a 50 water, uh, that was in existence in the city at that time with its call letters. 
and ask to have them changed to C U O A. C representing Canada, of course, and U O A, the university. However, we were told we couldn't have CU as a prefix because it was already taken up by Portugal or some other country, and so we had to settle for some other prefix. CK sounded pretty good to us because K was a pretty easy letter to pronounce and to be understood, and UA was tacked on as representative of the University of Alberta Station. Sweet. Um, so this is a quote I found from A.E. Otwell. So he was, again, the first depart or, yeah, Department of Extension Dean. Um, so from the beginning, CKUA has been interested in experimental broadcasting of drama, symphony, and other classical music, and in presentation of young artists seeking to broaden their experience. Continually, the idea of developing the use of radio for education and culture has been dominating, has been the dominating feature of Olet's work. So even though that quote's from 1945, I do find it quite relevant to what we're still doing in 2020. Um, like maybe the way that we share education has changed, uh, but a lot of those core values still kind of run through the station. So, um, so how does the library fit into CKUA? Since the beginning of CKUA, the library's built its collection in support of what CKUA was broadcasting. So we have a variety of media from Amberola cylinders to pre-release digital albums that are sent to us by record labels and almost every medium in between. We've got wire recorders from the 1940s when we had, uh, sorry, my family has arrived upstairs. Uh, <laughs> so we have wire recorders from um, news, uh, news reporters that worked at the station that would take them out and um, do the recording on a wire recorder and then bring it back. Um, and John Worthington, who was the station manager for years and years um, and then transitioned to uh, a host as the old disc jockey. I, I paused for a minute there because there was a time where he was doing both, but he wasn't supposed to be the station manager as well as the uh, on-air host. So he had uh, John Worthington as his on-air name and Jack Hagerman as his station manager name. But he has stories of uh, having his sister, I believe, who was uh, very nimble with crocheting and she would have to crochet the wires back together because they were quite delicate. Um, so one pitch, we've got uh, quite a few of our own acetate transcription discs, um, not the giant 16 inch ones, which I'll talk about later on, um, but the size of a little bit larger than a 45. Um, and we, through some of those, we have um, our own history. So one in particular that we found before moving that we listened to was um, CK Way announcer Art Ward, and he was narrating the play-by-play -play of a hockey game between, um, sorry, I wanna make sure I get this right. Uh, the Edmonton Flyers and the Saskatoon Quakers from 1949. So we've got media, we've got ephemera that's been kept over the decades, um, but we also have a lot of material that's been donated to us. Um, people know that CKUA has a large library and many times when they're looking to downsize or can't keep a collection that they've built over their lives, they want to make sure that it's going to find a new home rather than a dumpster. Uh, support from our community is part of why we've become such a treasury of recordings. We have a curated collection that goes like far beyond the 94 years that we've been exist in existence in Alberta. So when I started in 2011, I spent a whole summer going through the donated material in our old basement. Uh, one of my favorite discoveries was a, a, a box, a microwave box, and it had about 150 uh, 45s from the 1960s and 1970s from the former Yugoslavia. 
and the owner at the time had gone through it. Her name was Maria and she had written her name in cursive on every one of those paper sleeves. Some of them have the years and some of them don't. The costumes, the costumes are the best part. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're still all together and they might not get as much played as they did in 1974, but uh, part of being a resource for a community to make sure that, you know, we can't keep everything that gets donated to us, but we, we have built quite a, quite a collection beyond what we've had just from accumulating things. Um, so the old basement in the old CK way um, building was when I started, it was filled with donations. Uh, the policy before I got there seemed to be sure we'll take it. We'll throw it in the basement and we'll deal with it later with the help of some volunteers. Um, so, sorry. Um, so when I, so when I started, we had quite a few, um, it was mostly 78s. There were some other stuff in there, but uh, the, the majority was 78s. And so we had a collection of catalog 78s, a collection of uncatalogued unsorted 78s, and then a giant pool table that had been down there when that building was still a bank. And I think they left it in there and that we were using the pool table to sort things out alphabetically. And that was a, there's a team of volunteers that were working on that. Um, and as a result of going through some of those, we found Vogue 78s, which were kind of the original picture disc, which I had no idea before I started that picture discs on 78s were a thing. I had only seen them on LPs. So we've got a few of those. Those all came in found through donations. And when I started, we had four that were found and we found another one um, as we're going through and sorting the donations. So that's the magical part. <laughs> Uh, so moving, we moved in 2012 and we first brought, the first broadcast from the new Alberta Hotel building aired on October 15th. Uh, we were not all in the building yet. Uh, they were still doing construction and we were, staff were moving back and forth. We ended up all moving in. Uh, shortly after that, but the library did not move. The basement wasn't finished yet. As you can see in this photo, we're, we are in the basement. We do have beautiful windows down there, but um, the basement was the last thing to get done. We had to wait for custom shelving to be sent to us uh, after the construction was done. That had to be installed. And then on top of that, we had to pack, move and pack and unpack the actual music. So in the old building, we had 78s, as I said, both cataloged and uncatalogued in the basement, along with the reel to reel tapes. Uh, the LP library was on the main floor and then the CD collection was on the sixth floor and there was no elevator between the fourth floor and the sixth floor. So it was about six months of packing and moving um, to move the whole library. We started in the basement uh, with an incredible team of volunteers. Um, and we were building boxes. They were dropping off flats of boxes. We were building boxes, taking them downstairs. It was uh, an organized line. And then we they were dropping off uh, mattress bags filled with packing paper that we were then dragging down the basement stairs to make sure that we could pack the um, the seventy eights, which are quite delicate because they're made out of shellac, so that they would all survive the mood, survive the move. So that was one part of it. Um, the CD collection on the sixth floor. Uh, we had not digitized all of our CDs. I'll talk more about the digitization project in a little bit, but um, at that point we had started, we hadn't quite finished. So we had the majority of our, our CD collection that the announcers use every day to build their shows. Um, and most of them needed it actively. So that was another kind of interesting challenge. And we, basically um, did the CDs last. We, again, had a team of volunteers building boxes as we were filling them. Uh, 
packed up 783 boxes of CDs in order, um, stacked them four high, had to hand bomb them down the two flights of stairs so the movers would be able to just come in with the dolly and pick them up and take them down the elevator and put them in order in uh, the truck. And then drive down the block, take them out in reverse order. So we would have them in the same order. There was, I'm not explaining the logistics of this that well, but it worked out pretty good. We only dropped one box and basically did all of that from starting to pack the CDs to having them on the shelf in the new building in three days. So that, um, I will never move again. I'm not gonna talk about it too much more. I think I still have some stress related issues. Um, so yeah, in this photo, you can see one of our movers uh, and then a volunteer breaking down boxes. So we did uh, have to find a new home for all those boxes after. Um, so juggling between an active library and maintaining the archival collection is kind of, that's the divide of the CKUA library. We have this archival collection of media, both commercial and our own programming, and we have an active collection that we're building in support of our broadcasters. So I divide my time between collection management and acquisitions, um, along with managing and working with student interns and volunteers. Um, just to touch on some of these uh, items on the slide here. So with collection management, we have, we have uh, a variety of formats that kind of hold our own uh, programming history. So CDRs that were backups of shows, reel-to-reel -reel tape, neither of those ha are, have a long lifespan if they're just kind of left on their own um, without any sort of exercising of the tape or uh, steps taken to try and preserve that information. Then there's formatting issues. There's uh, quite a few shows that were digitized by a former staff member many years ago and they're all in real audio, which um, we tried to uh, convert into an MP3 or a WAV file this summer and none of them, none of those audio files are workable. Uh, digital storage, of course, that's the other issue is if we, we make a copy of everything, we still don't necessarily have a spot to put it in. And then metadata issues with respect to some of the reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Um, and I'll talk about this later when I kind of get into the interview portion of it, but sometimes the items that they decided to keep, um, they decided to keep because it's something cool rather than like, um, like a purposeful decision to hold on to something. So really we're, we're trying to figure out what exactly is happening on this tape, who could be interviewed, what the program was based on um, sparse information on, um, on whatever sticker they put on the box. Um, I have binders of CDRs from arts reporting and that host had printed off notes and stuck them in with each CD, but it's kind of only workable to that person's mind and he is retired now. So it's a lot of <laughs> legacy file keeping along with, you know, trying to instill some order into things and then upkeep of machines to play formats. So for a while, our real to real tape machine wasn't working. We do have some, talented engineers in our um, organization and we do have a CCAN at the FM storage site so we don't throw anything out and we have old reel-to-reel -reel tape players that they can use to create one zombie working reel-to-reel -reel tape player. <laughs> um, under acquisitions, so this you know kind of takes up the first, it's, it's the priority. That's how, that's the larger portion of my job is making sure that the users of our system, our hosts have what they need to do their job. So whether that is an album that came out a couple years ago that for some reason we didn't get and making sure that we have a copy or if it's something that's coming up and they're really excited about to make sure that we have the advanced singles. Um, there's, 
a whole bunch of stuff. Or for some of our hosts that aren't in Edmonton, if they know we have something on LP, making sure that I can digitize that and get it in the database so that they can um, have access to it. So we do get upwards of 700 submissions per week. Um, again, some of those are the shotgun approach from uh, artists looking for um, for play on the radio. So whether it's super relevant to our our exact station or not, sometimes they just they send it to everybody. Like we report our charts to Earshot and to the National Campus Charts Association. So our emails out there because the, I, this isn't a bad thing, but there is quite a bit of kind of gatekeeping that needs to happen in this role. Um, so and then. CRTC regulations on CanCon and how it impact, impacts the library. That's definitely something that's kind of cropped up in the last year or so, um, is making sure that we do have enough valuable um, Albertan and Canadian music for our hosts to make sure that they're, they're able to fulfill their CanCon um, requirements in their shows. Okay, so back to I was talking about our um, our students. So last summer um, I had the opportunity to hire a couple of excellent and very talented summer students as part of the STEP program, uh, which is the Summer Temporary Employment Program, which doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Um, but I had two students for one summer and we went through our media archive and we worked on assessing the collection. So there were several boxes that hadn't been looked at since our move in 2012. Um, they were not part of the library. They were part of a different department, but then they just were left in the archive room. So we went through them and found um, a ton of program backups that came uh, that were burned on CDRs. So one of the positive things that came out of that, aside from finding this treasure trove of um, at least seven years of uh, programming is we found uh, a new series of Play It Again. Um, anyone that listens to CKUA might be familiar with that. It's um, a show that we had. It covers uh, the years 1920 to 1955 and the number one hits. And it's been on for years and it has been the same program that rotates all the way through those years. So we found a newer uh, season of that. So that was, we were, we were very excited. <laughs> um, okay, so after going through and kind of assessing our archival collection, we built a database to keep it accessible and organized. Uh, so our step intern, Joe Hodgson, did an enormous amount of work, um, both in physically going through and reorganizing our archival area, um, but also in feeding all these. So this is just one, uh, one screenshot on here and we have multiple tabs that are all interlinking, but um, I chose this one just so you can kind of see the variety in formats on there. Um, so he went through and he listed the names of the programs, the formats, account on each um, and recording all this information. So we built our database in Airtable. Uh, we have the program name, notes on the program, uh, staff members who worked on these programs as either hosts or um, producers. And then we have started, it's almost an impossible task, but we started a staff directory. So that feeds into that. So that we can um, try and go through and capture the biography of some of the really talented people that have come through CKUA and worked on these programs. Um, so this is another, this is uh, Sarah, my step intern, Sarah Taylor. She spent hours listening to interviews with guests. Uh, she also cataloged them into the database. So this is a separate tab on the same one. Um, and she went through and listened to these interviews and wrote comprehensive notes on what was happening in the interviews. So she timestamped them. Uh, the performances, the context of the interview, if they were there to promote an album or a festival, if they mentioned other artists as influence um, or venues past and present, really anything that will help this interview be used in the future. 
So we're trying to create pathways for hosts to build their stories. So it's not just about how many times Corblund has been interviewed, but how many other artists list him as an influence. And which interview exactly it was when he brought in his rope to teach Monica Miller how to tie a proper knot in a lariat. Which did happen. <laughs> We have a large number of interviews on real to real tape that are missing a lot of metadata. So in some cases, we only have the name of the person that's being interviewed. Some of them are finished interviews, some are raw without editing, um, and no indication of which show they ended up being in. So the work Sarah was doing has been carried on by a couple of student volunteers, uh, one from Nate's broadcasting program and one from McEwen's LIT program. So it's slow going, but it's a lot of fun for the students. Um, they're learning how to digitize the tape, how to bake the tape, how to digitize the tape, how to look for clues in the audio and the physical media to try and figure out like who, what host that was, when it was, what they were promoting and when the interview took place. So our audio archive has a lot of metadata about the programs we have, but it's currently removed from the media. Uh, looking ahead, ideally we would have a system in place that has our digital media and metadata in one record. Right now what we do have digitized is on a shared network drive, which is not ideal and it has its own set of concerns like we have space limitations, there's backup issues, as well as limited metadata linked to the actual art, the actual audio. Um, we do have issues with the formats of our archival programming. I kind of touched on that with uh, the real, both the digitized um, kind of like file format and then our reel to reel tapes themselves. So, you know, I mentioned that we kept them in the basement of the old building that we were in that building for 50 years and it was kind of falling down around us. Every time it rained, there was water leaking in the bathroom or in the basement. There was, it's not a good spot to keep um, magnetic tape. So we have issues. Um, our tape suffers from sticky sh sticky shed syndrome. So it is caused by basically the deterioration of the binders in the magnetic tape. Um, we've, we've got a food, dehydr food dehydrator we have set up. So we use it to bake our tapes before we play them. And if they show any signs of like sticky shed, I will get it, sticky shed syndrome. So Almost all of ours do um, have that issue. And you can kind of see on these images here where this is what happens if, if you play the tape without baking it and it has this issue, um, you can permanently lose that audio. So the magnetic tape is flaking off of the polyester back. Um, and then it'll also leave all kinds of residue and gunk on like the heads of the, the tape player. So it can affect other tapes that you listen to if there's all kinds of gunk on there. Um, do, do, do. So, and the Spoken Web Project presented a few weeks ago. So uh, if anybody caught that, we have been talking with them. We've had some super positive talks. Um, to collaborate with them as a way to help digitize and preserve some of the interviews that we have. So they're looking for readings with interviews, sorry, readings and interviews with poets, authors, artists that fall under their scope, the scope of their project. Um, if anyone didn't attend that one, I encourage you to look up the project because it's very cool. Um, and yeah, again, COVID has kind of impacted the start of that, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity to work together and for these tapes that we have to really just be found again and reach a new audience. So digitization project. So this, this picture is the main control studio of the old building. Um, that is John Reichman and the Jaybirds. And I think during a fundraiser, but um, we had shelving on every conceivable wall for CDs in that um, sixth floor space. So at one point, long before I got there, but there was a bathroom that was taken over to put more CDs in. Um, so there's pink tile behind the <laughs> CD shelving. Uh, so yeah, I, I've, I've kind of touched on a few other like media formats that we've had in our collection. 
We have a few concerns about like degradation and accessibility of our media. So formats such as CDRs, cassette tapes, DAT, and digi digitized audio files. Um, almost all of these are formats that can be stable if they're treated correctly, but CKUA, like many other organizations, hasn't really had the opportunity to keep these in archival conditions. Um, so there are issues. Uh, what should be kept? How do we, do we have the space for it? Who needs access? What are we, why are we keeping what we're keeping? Um, most of these items hold like our own programming archives. The media in the library that we use for broadcasting is less precarious. So digitization. In 2012, we worked with an external company to digitize our CD collection. Uh, we had started making digital copies of our CD library in a custom database that was integrated with our playout system in 2009. So having our library available digitally means it's accessible to all of our hosts, um, not just the ones that are in Edmonton or in Calgary. So we have hosts um, in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Austin, Texas. We have a couple in Vancouver. And having a digital database means that really our collection is accessible to all of our hosts, not just the ones that can physically reach it. Um, so digitization, it was slow going. Um, we started on our own. That was actually, like I said, I started as a volunteer. I started ripping CDs. Um, and it was estimated that it was going to take about 10 years to get done if we did it all ourselves. So we looked outward and we found contractors that were based in Seattle and they had done a few projects mostly with um, LPs rather than CDs. They had not done CDs before, but they came to CKWA and went through, digitized all the albums Without metadata, they just had an internal um, numbering system for each of them. So each album had a number, each track within it had a number. And they photographed the front and the back because we do need that information in our database as well. Um, so then left all the audio on our server, took their file structure back to Seattle, built their own database. Um, so that they could have data entry people look at those front and back images and do all the data entry and then they were going to send us metadata in batches that we would then match with the filing number um, so match the audio with the metadata and then kind of pull it in through the back end of our database and that did not take one year <laughs> so we uh, there's some trial and error um, between the programmer with our contractor and the programmer with our database people and kind of there were more than a few conversations that seemed totally unworkable until uh, my colleague Bina and I who worked on this project just like forced the two of them to talk on the phone they didn't want to talk to each other and then once they actually started talking it was it was easy not the project just individual problems so um, <laughs> we uh, we ended up, it took a couple of years, but once we worked out the technical issues, it came pretty fast. We were getting about 2,000 um, 2, albums added a week yeah, for a short period there. So once they were ingested into the system, um, myself and one super volunteer went through and we needed to basically finish off the record, write the biography for each of those artists, some of that is still remaining, um, but and then verify that all the information was entered correctly. Um, we did run into major issues with our classical collection, specifically in that their system did not work because a lot of the classical CDs don't have all of the information listed on the back of the CD. So we as an organization decided like earlier um, that we would leave classical for now, continue on with the rest of the project. Um, that I had some reservation, it, it wasn't workable in the way we were going to do it with a contractor. Um, but long, long ago when they were, when CKUA staff were moving from the card catalog system to a digital system called PC file. It was a DOS program. Um, they had 
they had a text recognition program and they were going through and scanning the uh, library cards, the card from the card catalog and trying to do the text recognition to pull that metadata and plug it into the DOS program. And I, from what I hear, that was very slow going. Um, a lot of those cards were typed out on a typewriter. It wasn't totally even and easy to read for uh, the computer at that time. And really, at when they got to the classical section, um, there was a lot more metadata and there was a lot of issues and they said, well, we're not going to worry about that now. We'll do it later. And it has never been done. Um, so our classical LP collection, you know, it's, it's not really used because it's only accessible on the card catalog. So when it comes time to talk about leading, like that's usually what we start with first because it's not used because no one can access it. Um, so that was my concern long term with uh, digitizing the CD collection. And so we've made steps um, to do that internally. It is very slow going, but it is happening. <laughs> uh, so more and more releases are coming as uh, digital only um, or as digital releases first and then followed up with the physical CD. Um, we're well positioned to take care of that um, since we've had this database running since about 2009. It is slightly clunky, um, but there's a lot of stations out there that are trying to go through these hurdles now um, and we, we've done it. So overall having a digital library puts us ahead of the curve and it definitely helped when everything shut down in March. So our hosts were fully able to work from home um, and put their shows together. There were some that were less familiar, but we, our super senior producer, Elliot Garnier, basically put together um, laptops and digital USB microphones. And we had our engineers put recording software on those laptops and sent the packages out to the hosts. So they were able to almost seamlessly, aside from some training issues, uh, continue on. So, oh, Oh, that's back. That's okay. I talked right through that. Behind there is a little picture of our database. Slightly clunky, but workable. Um, so now I will, I've got just a few of kind of the cooler items to show you and a couple of sounds, sound things. So uh, transcription discs. I had uh, kind of mentioned at the top that we had we have some transcription discs from our own hosts, um, but we also have a large collection of gigantic 16 inch transcription discs. Um, you need a special turntable with a 16 inch platter to play them. We do have one. It is at, it's not at our station right now. It's at the FM transmitter site. Um, and we used to have our own uh, engraver for CKUA staff where they could record their own and they were the 16 inch ones. So that was for news, current events for our um, hosts. So that the engraver we do not have anymore. We do have um, a giant stack of blank acetates that I actually found in, <laughs> before we were moving, I found them in the junk room before you got into the basement and they had uh the old disc jockey jack worthington's name on it i had asked him about it and he would come in in the evening to record his show he was in his 80s at that time and i had i had emailed him to say like oh i, I found this like weird heavy paper wrapped package that has your name on it and uh apparently he had ordered them decades earlier and for some reason they didn't make it to him but they stayed at the station and got thrown in the junk room and so they were brand new i still have them and they're like beautiful shiny blank acetates um so most of the 16 inch transcription discs that we have are um from the u.s army so the armed forces radio service they uh, started sending them to us in 1944. We were sending news and weather reports by telephone line to CFWH in Whitehorse. 
at the request of the American Army. They were in the north building the Alaska Highway. So we, they, the Armed Forces Radio Service sent specially edited versions of popular network shows that had already been broadcast. And then we would open up the telephone line um, that they had already installed as part of the construction of the Alaska Highway. And we would transmit them to Whitehorse. So when they were being broadcast, no one in the Yukon could make a telephone call in or out. Uh, so the Edison Amberola 30, this is um, a cylinder phonograph player that we have. Um, it was donated to us and it was, it was in working, original working order when we got it donated to us. Um, it did have a brief moment where it needed to get repaired um, and it is now working again. <laughs> so the Amberola 30 was part of the second series released by Edison and it's one of the most common tabletop phonographs available. I think, um, I think the U of A has one uh, at the Sound Studies Institute. I think, I'm not sure. Um, so their numbers refer to the original dollar price. There was the 30, the 50, and the 80. So the 30 is the most common model. Um, it plays a four minute blue amber roll cylinder. They're made of celluloid and they have a plaster Paris core. So that's usually um, the issue if there's damage to the cylinder is that plaster Paris core, if it's held in a a humid environment, it'll absorb the water and it'll crack. And that's usually the the blue part is good. The plaster of Paris part uh, sometimes a little crumbly on the inside. So we, yeah, it was donated to us in 2013. Um, we, since then, we've had another donation of just the cylinders. There's a lovely lady who donated about 250 of them to us. She had hand cataloged, hand written out um, all of the titles of them, all 250. Any of the cylinders that didn't have the cardboard sleeve, she had wrapped up in plastic wrap because she was worried they were gonna get damaged or scratched when she brought them in. So it was very sweet. Um, and I have a little video of this playing. Can you guys see that? Thumbs up, yes. Okay, great. Oh. Actually, we're still seeing your slides right now. Are you? Yeah, okay. not the not the video. Hang tight. Sorry. You might have to change to to sh to share a different window or something maybe. Yeah. Sorry, bear with me. I'm a millennial, I can do this. Mm -mm. You know what? Can I? Oh, I'm so sorry. Hang tight. Um, Can you see that now? Uh, no, it just no. kind of zoomed out a little, but it's still your, <laughs> still your PowerPoint slides. One thousand curses. Okay, a new share. You might have to un. I got it. I got it. Oh, okay. Sorry. Fair.
Okay. Um, which one do I have this on? Oh. Okay. Okay. Are we back to? Yes. Okay. Great. So next up, um, we have an Edison diamond disc player. So basically, it is the cylinder except for flattened and there's audio on both sides. So if you could see you want to, I did the shot on the side and you can see the uh, stylus, it, it bobs up and down. It's not the same as like a modern LP where it kind of goes in the grooves. Um, so the diamond disc, I, I tried to take a picture of this where you could see uh, an average 45 beside it to, to see really how thick it is. It's about a quarter of an inch thick. Um, so that's because the, the diamond stylus in the diamond disc player, uh, it moves vertically up and down and it really needs a, a totally flat surface. If there's any warping on there, then it won't play. Um, so they, and they play about five minutes per side. So really, instead of a four minute cylinder, you doubled the time by having two five minute records. Um, and our model is the H19 Heppelwhite model, which uh, was unveiled in March of 1919. Um, and bear with me while I navigate this one more time. Okay. Great. <laughs> Flawless. I'm gonna sorry I'm gonna cut that a little short just because we're kind of creeping up on the time here um, so sharing is caring how do we share we are a non circulating library but we're always looking to collaborate and share our library with the public um, we've had some fun partnerships in the past we partnered with ECAMP, the Edmonton City is Museum Project, and ran a summer program of pop-up museums where we had programming from ECAMP with maps and questions, um, polls, and tried to use the themes of those to create displays of the library and archive materials. So we had started at CKUA with our party in the park, then we had a tent at Heritage Days, um, which is that last photo there. Um, and then finally, we were at the Prince of, a Prince of Wales Armory during free, edition, free admission day in Edmonton. Um, we usually have open houses around our fundraisers in the spring and fall and host school tours throughout the year. So pictured here, we have a volunteer uh, leading a school tour showing the model of our old building. Um, and one of my field placement students with our find Stovo game which is like, where's Waldo, but Grant Stovall. <laughs> so, and yeah, I, you know, we, we've, done, we've done a lot of stuff to try and collaborate and like just do fun stuff, share information about the library. We're always interested in hosting tours, but um, yeah, that's, that's about it. I don't know how to stop sharing, All so right. you might have to help me. I'll help you. 
Let's okay. See. I think I just helped you. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that was just, <laughs> that was fantastic. And I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> now I'm wary that we're, we're four minutes to eight. And so what I'd like to suggest um, is, yeah, actually first let's all do a little, a little virtual <laughs> applause. Everybody turn your cameras on. We should do this every time we haven't been doing this. So. <laughs> Very it's wonderful. Yay. Make whatever noise you want to make. You can do something more creative than this. We're sound studies after all. Um, so thanks. Thanks so much for that. And um, just, uh, I know we're, we're approaching eight. And so I'd like to go ahead and I would like to open it up for questions, um, understanding that some people may need to leave at eight o'clock. Um, and, uh, but otherwise, um, we'll, we'll go a little bit past eight just to get a couple questions in at least. And um, I have, I have several questions. Oh, Brian does too. Um, I'll say one and then, and then, and then Brian can go. Um, I just am curious about what the process for donating things to CKUA is. Um, I have a few 45s that were recorded locally that I could not find listed on Discogs. And I thought that, that you would be like a good uh, person to give those to because I don't know what to do with them basically. Yes, I am. Uh, a professional hoarder, but I, <laughs> like most people, it's a K-way. No, so uh, it depends on what the collection is. Uh, that sounds something right up my alley that would really be beneficial to CK Way. Um, I do have a lot of people that just want to make sure that their collection is going to go somewhere. So I, we have, um, we have a web form on our website for people to fill out just to give me some like basic information and then I kind of contact them after that to let them know if you know sometimes it's just about finding home for it sometimes it might not be something that we want to keep um, and I have uh, a contact that will purchase collections um, that owns our used record store in the city so and he will take the whole collection um, if I refer someone to him so there is, there is a process, but most people that come to CKOA looking to find a home for the record collection are not going to leave frustrated, so. Cool. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll unmute. People seem to be permanently muted, so I can unmute them. I'll unmute Brian first, and then we can go to Karen. Or can I? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm thought not we... the only one. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thanks, thanks, Tom. You've released the power. Um, I guess I, I don't. I have two questions, uh, and I don't know if one you can answer, and the other might have been in there, and I might have just missed it. The first is, you know, I've been curious about talking to campus stations at least about what they can keep going forward in their music libraries in terms of space and what they prioritize. And I'm curious, with that much still coming in, and this is the part I might have missed, with the eight albums a day, are you digitizing them and then giving those physical CDs away, or are you keeping some or all? So right, right now, oops, sorry. Uh, so right now, the eight albums we add a day aren't all physical. Um, we do still get a lot of physical material, uh, and. I was, I don't know what word to use there. I could build a fort um, at my desk right now with all the stuff that was sent to us in the six months I wasn't going into the office. So <laughs> that's a future problem. But um, I, I've gone through a lot of it. So in terms of what we do, we're not digitizing and getting rid of stuff. Um, we right now are keeping things. If we're not at, uh, or really anywhere close to capacity on our CD shelves at the moment. Um, we have room for 100,000 CDs. So we do have some space and we do go through and try, when we did the CD digitization project, um, because we had to go through all of the CDs, we, I did take an opportunity to do some weeding at that time, um, if not necessarily getting rid of like, there was a large amount of new age music that hadn't been played in quite a long time. So I mean, weeding as like a library concept is a little more difficult at CKUA because, you know, we don't have like check-in 
and check out records to kind of like verify that. So it's really about um, talking to users and being aware of what we're actually playing um, and what specific hosts might need. So we, we did, we do, we do have space issues like generally, um, CDs aren't necessarily the issue. We're adding stuff. A lot of it is digital. Mm -hmm. Um, there was something else in there that I didn't answer, but, um, yeah, I was just curious about if the CDs were at capacity, if you had to get rid of them, I was curious about what was maybe prioritized. Um, and then, but yeah, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that part, but I'm curious to you if you're allowed to say how much that can, that company from Seattle charged to do that work. Was it, um, like it very expensive? But, like somewhere? So we went with that. I'm not going to tell you exactly how much yeah. I will. We can, we can DM on Twitter. Um, but <laughs> we got a rather competitive price from them um, because they had not done a project like this before they had done lps which was different um and there were some it was a small company it was one of the like first kind of jobs that they were doing um of this scale that was cross-border and uh there were some complications but when we were, we were worked out most of the tech problems, but before we actually kind of got things rolling, where apparently the person that we were dealing with who was, um, you know, the leader of the company was not in fact the leader of the company. It was someone else who was out of the country. And then he came back and decided he wanted to sell it. So the company we were working with dissolved. Yeah. One guy took off, the other two, created a new company to finish the project. Um, at that point, we reevaluated the contract. It was um, complicated yeah, and like fun. Great, thank you. Okay, I think Kay Howell is next. Sorry, that's like, I can't see the first name, but I'm gonna- Aaron, yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Ariane. Um, so I'm wondering in terms of the move to the new building, is there anything like, is the new library meeting the needs of the collection? I know that it's climate controlled and that sort of thing, but are there any, did you have any learnings now that you've been in there for a few years about um, what might have been done differently or is it, is it, is it perfect? Thank you. Yeah, it's not perfect. So <laughs> That's not a criticism. Um, but you know, when, as an organization, when we were moving into that space, having been in the previous space for such a long time, um, I think that there was, you know, there was a lot of excitement and there was a lot of um, like planning that had gone into it. But when it came to, when it came to like finding space, we had a lot of space in the old building in the new building, it's technically like less floor space. Um, so in terms of how that affects the library, you know, we have a big, beautiful library in the basement. There's a lot of room, um, but also the archive room that was kind of designated the archive zone is actually like a shared space between um, our admin side and our uh, accounting boxes. There's a lot of other stuff going in there. And then we didn't necessarily, like finding shelves for that wasn't something that was done before we moved in. So I think, you know, had I, if I go crazy, never do this again, I'm definitely gonna have some learnings. And just uh, a little more questions ahead of time about, assessing the collection before we pack it up and move and decide how and know like even how much shelving we're going to need where we're going to put all of this stuff and I mean part of that was kind of um we had the option to, and took it exercise the option I should say to um do some off-site storage with the moving company that moved us so the 78s and the real real tapes stayed off-site for I want to say five or six months before we actually got into that space and um 
got some shelving in place, but again, part of the issue with that was not really knowing necessarily how much space we were going to need for those items because in the old building it was spaced out on a whole level basically and then they were already packed up like we didn't we couldn't just do a count because they weren't all cataloged so when they were off site and out of mind you know these are some of the complications now that we're in the building um my current issue is shelving for lps and trying to figure out where we can put um shelving with the floor capacity and against which walls, because we're like my office is beside the elevator shaft. Some of the stuff that I don't know if there's a way that we could have um, navigated it in advance, but there's always stuff. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I think Meg is next, and then there's a really important question in the chat that I want an answer to right away. But, but, but first we'll, we'll ask uh, Meg to ask her question. Thank you. Um, I, I have two, but we could just start with one if you want. Uh, my first one, Ariane, is like there's so much in the CKUA library that is of a certain time. And I'm curious, as someone who's very intimate with the collection, what do you think are the gaps in, in the CKUA library? So that's very interesting because I 100% agree. And it really, you know, because, because the collection has kind of been built on what was being broadcast at that time, there are um, big gaps. Like we didn't play hip hop for a long time and now it's not um, that wild to play hip hop. And we have um, big gaps on things that, I think were probably sent to us at the time that we have to, you know, kind of go back. And even, you know, if we look at what what's broadcast now versus like six years ago, we're playing, I think, more diversity in the daytime. Um, so trying to look forward while building the collection, it's not just about what's going to be played now. Um, it's it's something I try and remedy. But yeah, I think that we're we don't have a lot of hip hop. Um, we have a little bit, but we don't have a whole lot of specifically Canadian independent artists. Um, now we have a loud show for an hour once a week um, and building up that collection has been a lot of fun, but uh, is definitely starting from scratch. So yeah. Second question. I'll, I'll make it quick, but I'm curious if we think of like the local CBCs that have basically over the last decade gotten rid of their CD libraries, their music libraries altogether, what kind of role do you think that the CKUA library plays uh, now, you know, is something that is so large and, and so extensive, despite the gaps that I already asked about? I mean, that's, that's fair. There's all kinds of organizations that aren't you know, they may have been libraries, but they're not necessarily got, they don't have that archival aspect of it. That's not their mandate. Their mandate is to be a radio station. Um, and I think that by having this as part of our, like, I think that it's part of the structure of our organization. It hasn't always been done like with a lot of forethought, but I think that um, that's part of why we have such um like a deep connection with our community is that you know they know they know that we have um we care about taking care of this collection and it's a cultural institution and uh having that mandate to not just not just serve our audience now but to take care of stuff and have it into the future and you know yeah sorry <laughs> I'll ask the question that was in the chat quickly, and I'm going to expand it slightly, um, which was, do you file the Smiths under Smiths or under the? Um, and, I, and, and my expansion is because you mentioned the, the issues with metadata with classical music. Um, and so I also had a question, which is just how do you, you choose what goes in what metadata categories for classical music? Because I have never... I think it's a difficult question, actually. There's so many people involved in making those 
those recordings. Yeah, so Smiths uh, are filed under S. Um, we invert a, uh, the, uh, that goes at the end. If it's a number, this is expanding upon that question. So if it's, uh, now of course I can't, the, the 427s, which is I think a surf band from Calgary. So it's the number 427 that gets filed, uh, numbers get filed before A in the alphabet. Um, yeah, if it's spelled out, then it goes by the letter. Um, so classical is, classical is interesting. So we have, we have an older database, um, called CARA. So that's kind of an iteration of the DOS program that I had mentioned that they had scanned the card catalogs into when we were moving, um, or we're planning on moving, um, we needed to upgrade from Kara because that DOS program was so old, it would not run on the new server in the new building. Um, so we basically, again, shoestring budget. Um, so <laughs> with the help of volunteers, we pulled the tables out, uh, put them in an access database that was kind of searchable and uh, installed that in the new building. So that has, you know, our LPs are 78s and then our classical music because again, the classical is kind of slowly being added. So that database um, is not, it's a little more difficult to search because for whatever reason, they never put the album title in, it's only by track or by piece. Um, but we have a field for soloists, uh, for group, for, um, composer, um, like chamber group, chamber, yeah, there's, sorry, there, I'm trying to mentally go through it. There's quite a few, um, and they all have their individual, um, kind of lines for that. We, in the newer database, um, it's a little bit easier. Um, it's not perfect, but we do have, so we kind of have the main entry for the artist performing the work. If there's two guitar players and a cello player, then we'll put it as person A ampersand, person B ampersand, person C. Um, if it is a work with multiple soloists and the only um, like kind of group that's on consistent throughout all tracks is like the symphony orchestra that's kind of providing the background then they get the main credit and we add all of those individual soloists in on each track um, there's a million different options so I won't go through all of them but I will say that our filing system for classical remains kind of the older system where we're working on ex extension numbers so it's uh, an alpha numeric system. So basically with classical, it's either G or H for the most part. Uh, so if it's G, then it is really the highlighting the work of the performer. So it's a recital of some sort. If it's under H, then it's highlighting the work of the composer. So if it's H, B, 2, then that is Bach. And then the number after the decimal is the individual recording. So I think we have like HB 2.507 at this point. Yeah. Again, tour anytime when the world's not on fire, it will make more sense. I'm sorry, Natalie. I, I think I muted you while you were trying to unmute yourself. <laughs> Not to worry. It's all good. Um, I just had a question that was maybe kind of related to Meg's question about gaps in the library. And that is that one thing that I've heard um, a lot more of lately, like just over the past few years, is Indigenous music on CKUA. And I was just wondering whether that was a gap that was has now been filled in the library or whether we always had that music and we've just started to hear it more? So I think that it's complicated. It's kind of both. Um, we are hearing more of it, but I think that 
that goes beyond, you know, we're, we're looking for it, but at the same time, there's more of it available. Um, I, I, we have had, we have a lot of indigenous recordings that go back a number of years, but it's not, they were kind it's, this is the decolonialize the library. It's all, it's a thing that's happening. Uh, a conversation, I should say, not a thing, but you know, a lot of the indigenous music that we had was stuck in the world section uh, under world Canada or world United States um, or whatever country those indigenous people were cataloged as at the time and you know some of it is field recordings but there is i think we are in a position now to have that um collection expanded and i don't think that it this is a this is a conversation that i've had um for a number of years where what like what is world music is is it the folk music of a specific world or like country i should say um or is it um is it just a, like music sung in a different language um and it depends on what collection you're looking at so with our collection when I started, the world section was a bit of a mess. The person who had been here before me was well-intentioned, but had decided to kind of like go beyond just the different countries. So like world yoga had a section and there was a section of world yoga music. Um, so we, there was some, there were some issues. And I think that some of the announcers were having troubles trying to build their programs based on like the, categories that were there and really that's the mandate of ck way is to help announcers build their programs so um you know as kind of genres evolve that becomes an interesting conversation because you know if if there's music that has um you know it's sung in spanish and it's Colombian influenced because the artist is Colombian, but it is kind of like contemporary pop music. Like, where does that fit? And in our current database and in our filing system, like we can only put it one spot. We other libraries, you know, that are evolving and you can tag multiple things on there. And I just have a notes field that's about this big to type that information in. So decisions have to be made and if I hear from announcers that they're not, they don't think that something should go there, then they'll let me know. That doesn't happen very often very more, anymore. Um, there was a time where we had some conversations, but I think that, you know, it is an evolution. And because we're using a digital system, it's a lot easier to find stuff. That was the main issue is that people would expect it to be in one section and it's not there. And now they can just type in the artist name or, you know, search by um, new music or the region and, you know, they'll see that information there. There, there were some interesting conversations when we were just with the, the old database and where they were looking for the physical album on the shelf where there was, I'm going to forget his name, but an artist from Cameroon who then released some traditional Cameroonian music, like folk music, and then moved to France and became a jazz musician. But then because they wanted those CDs to end up side by side on the shelf, it all got stuck under Cameroon. Um, when I don't necessarily agree with that, even with the old filing or uh, database system, you can search under the name and find it in two different spots. So that was, that was a large conversation I had with a number of announcers when I started. So. So it looks like we're getting close to 830. Um, so I might just um, end tonight with one final question from that I have for you, just a quick one um, that I'm curious about. Um, it has to do with um, the kinds of things that you keep in the archive. And one of the things that I wondered about, um, I don't know if you've, some of you might have heard of something called cart tapes um, or carts as they were called. And they're based on these things, these eight track tapes, but eight tracks were sort of a 
outgrowth of um, of carts, which were used in the 60s and 70s and all through the 80s and 90s, even in some places, especially in the States, for um, quickly putting in um, PSAs or advertisements. And so I'm wondering if, if the, I, I realize the radio station might not have had quite the same model for funding and maybe didn't have to play cart ads and things, but still these were sometimes used for PSAs and stuff. And I just find them really curious because there's, that, I mean, I'm holding up an eight track, but the cart tapes, there, there's just stuff on them that you never find, like very local kinds of ads or PSAs or whatever. And it must be a whole world in and of itself. But I just wondered if you might have run into any of that kind of stuff. So we definitely used to use those. Um, our our uh, playout system, which is through um, a company called OMT. Um, so basically they, they designed our, I will get, this is a long answer. It's the last one it has to be. So our um, library database is designed by OMT. Uh, it was a custom build for us because it integrates with the playout software. So we have kind of the production suite where artists, or, sorry, announcers can move music into their folders. They'll have a folder and it's got their, based on their initials and then there's a cut number for, you know, sequentially each track that gets added. Um, we also use that for our um, ads for our pre-recorded programs. That's a different folder. So there's a lot of um, capability in there and it, different folders are coded to different things for whether it sends that metadata out through the playlist and to our website or if it doesn't. Um, but it is called the cart wall. We call it cart wall in 2020 because that used to be a little wall that had all those carts in it. Um, and a lot of our staff have been there for a while. So it's just the name. It is if you're talking about cart wall, then you're talking about uh, the, uh, the production suite where all those shows are loaded. And if something's loaded in cart wall, then that show is ready to go for, you know, when it's supposed to air on the weekend or that evening. So uh, I, that being said, I don't think we have any of those carts um, here still. I think that because that wasn't a library, so there's kind of library and then there's programming so some of the stuff that we've had some of those more antique type things like those have just been kept for a while and then especially in the move i've kind of taken them um and decided that those are mine now <laughs> under my realm i should say that's this is sounding a little territorial but um in terms of like when systems get upgraded stuff like that it, it wasn't always we do have um we do have a lot of stuff that people have said oh we should save one of these for posterity but i haven't seen any carts so okay thank you well that um this has just been a great a great evening and i have so many more questions i'll save them for when we see each other in person sometime hopefully um so again, thank you so much for this amazing talk. This has been so fun. And thanks to everyone for, for coming tonight.